show you. We're in our last week on this series on uh, Before They Were Heroes, and it's been a great series, hasn't it? We've gone over a lot of different people, all in the Old Testament. We've gone over Joshua, Moses, Joseph, Elijah, and Elisha, Abraham. Last week we, st- or we, we looked at Nehemiah, and then last week we studied Ruth. Today we're going to the New Testament. Is anybody happy about that? <laughs> but we're only going to be there for one week and uh, entering next week, which is Friends Day. Are we excited about Friends Day? Yeah. Woo! Sunday, March 17th. I think first service was a little more excited about it, so uh, we'll see. We'll see, but we're inviting our friends to come to church. We're going to have a great time together. We're going to have a, a lunch together afterwards, a cookout, and... Um, it's just going to be an awesome time. But today's hero is in the New Testament. In fact, I was going to name my firstborn son this. I was convinced that my first son's name, and I only have one son, so you, you'll tell right away this didn't happen. But it was going to be Andrew Espen. Andrew Espen. E-S-P-N. I was literally going to name my kid after a sports channel. All right? <laughs> because Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus and sports, and I wanted a son that brought people to Jesus through sports. I wanted like a Tim Tebow Jr., but how many of you know that you don't want anything for your children outside of what God wants for your children, right? And so while I am proud to say that Caden made the all-star T-ball team, who even knew? Who knew, right? I get the message that they want him to play on the All-Stars. I'm like, he's six years old. I'm thinking, well, All-Stars? What? We're just lucky if they can keep their attention for longer than three innings, you know? But he, even though I had a plan, God had a much better plan. He revealed to me, and names are important. Sometimes I stutter and stammer over names in the Bible. But listen, names are important. They, they are part of our identity. And the Lord, through a very, very spiritual journey, revealed to me that Caden's name was to be Caden Micah Emmons, not Andrew Espen. While my desire was one thing, God had a different desire. And and Caden means friend or companion, and Micah stands for who resembles the Lord. And I thought, you couldn't want a better name than friend or companion resembles the Lord. So I don't have an Andrew Espen, but I want to name him Andrew because of one of my heroes in the Bible, and that is the man named Andrew. One thing that makes him a hero to me is this, is that Andrew is a friend who knew what really mattered. Do you have any friends in your life that know what really matters? You know, you might tell them no, but the answer is still yes, right? They know what really matters. When you need a friend, they seem to be there. They they, They just know what matters in your life. And today's big idea is simple one. God makes ordinary people heroes. We've looked at all these people in the Bible. We've seen these extraordinary deeds that they did. We see Moses, how he parts the Red Sea. We see Joshua, how he commands the armies. We've seen Elijah and Elisha, how they do all these incredible things. Call down fire from heaven. I mean, that sounds legit to me, right? These guys are amazing. But one thing is for sure, they were just people like you and me. You realize that? That there's nothing different about Moses than there is about Kenny Wheeler. Nothing different about Elijah than there was about Tom. I mean, these these people were just people. It wasn't anything great that they did. It was just their obedience to do what God had called them to do and to be who God called them to be. Well, you might not know much about Andrew. In fact, I would probably bank on the fact that many of you in here don't know much about Andrew. He's mentioned 15 times in the Bible, and most of those times he's noted as being one of Jesus' 12 closest friends. Other times, the majority of the times that he is referred to, he's referred to as Peter's brother. How many of you are sibling, right? And how many of you get your identity? Oh, you know. That's Rod's brother. Oh, that's Randy's brother. By the way, that was me growing up. I was six years younger than my brothers, and I was always known as their brother. Or that's Ron's son, the chief of police, you know? And sometimes we even say this to people. If we're close to somebody, then we'll say, well, you know, their brother or their sister. Oh, you know, their spouse. Whatever the case is, he was identified as Peter's brother. But that doesn't make him insignificant. I want you to understand something today that you don't have to be mentioned. Your name doesn't have to be brought up in order to to be significant to God. One of the most significant people in the Bible is Andrew, and he's only mentioned 15 times. 
He's a person of great significance. Here we are thousands of years later and you have a person standing up here that told you that he was going to name his son after this man. Has to be pretty significant in order for that to take place. And while we don't know a ton of things about Andrew, there's a few things we do. The first one is that he's an ordinary fisherman. A common job back in the day, but it didn't require schooling to be a fisherman. It just required learning how to fish. So they would go out and they would fish day in and day out. It was no doubt a difficult job. How do we know that, they were, that he was a fisherman? How do we know that Peter was a fisherman? John and James, how they were fishermen? Well, because the Bible tells us in Matthew 4, 18 and 20. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, by the way, that's a beautiful place. If you ever get the opportunity to go see the Sea of Galilee, it is a fantastic, fantastic place. I don't blame him for hanging out there and walking along there. Um, just a gorgeous place. But he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. This is their job. This is what they did. For us today, it might be picking oranges or going to the office building or, or working for Amazon, whatever it is. This is what they did. This is what their identity was. This is all they knew. How many of you know when you do something like fishing, usually you grow up around a fisherman. You learn how to do it from a young age. You learn about what it is and, and who it is that you're to be in order to do the job. Well, in verse 19, it says, Jesus called out to them, Come and follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. It's pretty serious to leave everything that they've ever known up to this point in their life. Young adults, tradition says that Andrew would have been born about 7 B.C. So when this happened, he probably would have been in his mid-30s pretty serious to leave it all behind, to take his nets, everything he had ever known. Probably the things that literally he grew up dreaming about. When I grow up, I'm going to have a nice boat. I'm going to catch me a lot of fish, and I'm going to be the best fisherman this town has ever seen. And Jesus comes along and he says, you know what? Forget your plans. Follow me. I have a much better dream for your life. And he just lets it go. Acts 4.13 says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Oh, you mean those fishermen? <laughs> For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I wonder when people look at you what they see. You know, we use this excuse that, well, pastor, he went to a seminary. You know, he's, he's got all those degrees and initials behind his name and everything. He's something special. No, I'm not. I'm just following the calling God has given in my life. But you know what? There's no stipulation that you need to know everything that's written in this book in order to tell people that Jesus loves them. In fact, a lot of times, the more you learn about this, the harder it becomes to communicate it to people. One of the greatest compliments people give me is that they, they're surprised to find out that I'm a doctor. I say, well, you know, it was, it was so simple. Well, yeah, God's Word is simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It doesn't need to get any more complex than that. We can go deeper, we can talk deeper, but we don't need to make it into something it isn't. So if you believe the lie that you need to be educated in order to tell people that God loves them, that Jesus loves them, don't believe that lie any longer. Amen. It's not necessary. We use it as an excuse. Well, here's the truth. We don't have all the answers. We can go to school our whole life and not have the answers. After school of ministry on Thursday night, one of the students and myself, we were, we were laughing at something very simple, but very complex and deep, and it's very clear. Neither one of us had really been exposed to it. But it makes very clear an argument for a deep spiritual truth. So, here's the deal. We're practicing our faith. We don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. Sometimes you're going to come and you're going to ask me something. I'm going to say, well, let me look it up. Let me do a search on that. Let me see what the, what the answer is. We don't have all the answers. Otherwise, it wouldn't be faith. It'd be fact. Life, here's great news. 
Life is not a closed book test. How many of you enjoyed closed book tests growing up, right? But when the teacher said, oh, don't worry, we're going to have an open book exam, everybody got excited. Life is an open book exam. And we have all the answers in this book. I wonder, are you searching for God's answers as hard as you would if you were in a history exam? If your grade depended on it, because guess what? Your soul depends on searching these books, this book. The majority of people that hung out with Jesus, they weren't educated people. Scripture said they, their, their jaws hit the floor when they realized they were uneducated, ordinary people. They were fishermen, four of them, a tax collector, a zealot, someone who is trained to actually be an assassin. You know, with all the political turmoil that was going on in those days, one of the dudes that hung out with Jesus, he wasn't exactly a great guy. He was willing to do whatever it took in the pursuit of religious or political ideals. Why do we think we have to have it all figured out? Relieve yourself of that pressure. You don't have to know everything. None of us do. Only God does. The other thing about Andrew is that he brought people to Jesus. Before he was here, he brought people to Jesus. That's basically all we know about Andrew. You know, the number one way to, to introduce people to Jesus that aren't raised in a church is through relationship. Through relationship. The majority of people that know Jesus as their Lord and Savior are either raised in the church and stay in the church or a friend tells them about Jesus. Very rarely does it happen where someone just comes into church and sits down, hears the word, accepts the word. Almost always it's caught by somebody else. I was going to say it's like the flu, but that's not a good example. <laughs> but it is contagious. They see how you're living, how your life is better how you're changed and they want that do you know nationwide less than 20 percent of people regularly attend church let me say that again just so that you can understand what i'm saying nationwide all of america less than 20 percent of the population of america attends church regularly so two out of every ten people are attending church three out of eight weeks that's how they define regular What's wrong with America? I don't know. You tell me. Yeah. Two out of ten people go to church. Two out of ten. Yeah. Statistically speaking, that's 38% of the church services attending makes you a regular attender, according to the documentation. Now, we understand life happens. My goal today is not to make you feel bad for missing church. Obviously, I just read a text message. <laughs> a text message that was connected with a prophecy that was given, a word that was given, that said, have a great day at work tomorrow. Be light. In other words, you're not going to be at church, and that's okay because life happens. But guess what? You are the church, so be light. See, because when you leave this place, your job is not done by coming to church. Your job is just beginning by being the church. That's right. Amen. If only two out of ten people are coming to church, then the other eight out of ten need to be impacted and infected by the church. That means we have a responsibility to go and to be light. Here's the deal in the Bible. They met every day. We meet twice a week. We ask for people to come on Sundays for an hour to an hour and a half. And then on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 7.30 for one hour. Two and a half to three hours total when you're talking about time between service, everything, just everything total. Two and a half to three hours just to attend. A week you have 168 hours. Which means if we're in church for three hours, we're roughly spending 0.017% of our time or less than 2% of our week in church. Roughly 1.5% to 2% of our time, but many of us don't have time for church. I wonder why that is. Are we truly seeking the Lord? 
Are we truly seeking his word? Do we really want it? I, I believe you really want it. I believe you do. And I'm looking at a very faithful people. And it's our job to leave and to tell the other people how great God is. Man, you wouldn't believe how awesome church was. You don't want to miss it next week. We're having friends week. We're having a cookout. They're going to give us free food. Who doesn't love free food? Uh, that's right. So at the beginning of Andrew's story, we learn that he's a disciple of John the Baptist. And once he hears who Jesus is, once he sees John say, whoa, I'm not even worthy to tie, the, the, tie your shoes. I'm not even worthy to, 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 to no. When he finds out Jesus is the Messiah, the one that's come to save the world, the first thing he does is he runs off and he finds Peter. John chapter 1, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. There we go again. Now, some people would say, I don't want to be known as that. Matter of fact, Simon, he's on his own. I'm sick of being labeled Simon Peter's brother. All he does, is he's just a... He just a blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying, right? If, you have, if you're a sibling, you know exactly what I'm saying. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said. And then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called... <laughs> yeah, which means Cephas, which means Peter. <laughs> Here's the thing. Jesus already knew the future. He already knew the future. He knew what was going to happen. He knew everything that was going to go down. It's like, you're going to be Peter. Now, did Jesus know there was going to be another Simon? Or did he know that Peter meant rock and he was going to call him a little pebble when he said the truth is, is that I love you, I've come to die for your sins and not this is the rock I'm building my church on. Like, did, what was Jesus? Well, we don't know what Jesus is trying to communicate here, but we do know that this teaches us that Jesus was omniscient, which means all-knowing. Yes. Here's the deal. Jesus is God in flesh. He isn't just a man. He isn't just a teacher. He's God in flesh. He knows everything about your life. Let me ask you this. Are you trusting Him? Are you trusting Him? I know that's kind of a loaded question because there's people in here that are like really going through some hard stuff in life and you're, and you're like, well, yes, but it's hard. Life is hard. It's easier when you trust the Lord, when you trust His plan. Have you declared Him the Lord of your life? Have you asked Him to save you? Have you asked Him to be the leader of your life? Today He's asking all of us to drop our nets and to follow Him. He's not saying to give up your careers, or at least I don't think He's saying that to the majority of us. But He is saying, follow me. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew, and Peter's hometown. See, they were ordinary fishermen that had a sudden career change. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus, and the way I see it, he has about a 24 to a 48 hour period where he's deciding what he's going to do with the rest of his life. And I think it was a rather easy decision for Andrew because Peter, or because Andrew, uh, Andrew always brought people to Jesus. It's easy to see what his decision was going to be because he always brought people to Jesus. He understood the importance of having a relationship with Jesus and he was full of faith. Full of faith. See, in, in the first passage in Matthew, it says that he was talking, he, saw, he, was, he was listening to John the Baptist and to Jesus. He realized it was inside. He ran off. He got Simon Peter. He grabbed Peter. And what did he do? He took him to Jesus. They saw what Jesus had to do, and they walked home. And along the way, I'm sure they're thinking, can you believe what we just saw? 
All right? And the next day, the first passage that we read, Jesus rolls onto the scene and he says what? Throw away your nets, come and follow me. But Peter, or Andrew was so full of faith, I don't think there was ever a question whether or not he was going to just get rid of his nets and follow Jesus. In fact, one of the stories that we hear about Andrew bringing someone to Jesus is one of the most famous miracles, and we're going to start a miracle series next week, one of the most amazing miracles we see in the Bible is found in John chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. It says, Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. <laughs> Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy the bread to feed all these people? Tom, do you remember on the day of hope when I came to you and I was like, we need 2,500 hot dog buns? <laughs> and you're like, okay. <laughs> You know, can you imagine there's this huge group of people coming. They don't have Walmart super centers during this time. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Philip is like, where are we going to get the bread for all these people? Or, or uh, I'm sorry, Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to get the bread for all these people? How are we going to feed them? To which Philip says... It says, he was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Again, do you trust God? He already knows what he's going to do. He already knows what the answer is going to be. He's God. Yeah. Right? Be anxious in nothing, about nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication, we request known to God. Listen, we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if those scriptures are true then why are we worried when things happen like needing to feed a bunch of people bread? Because whenever God has a plan, it'll come to pass. It'll come to pass. He says, Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. So I remember, like I said, the day of hope, I turned to Tom and I'm like, we need 2,500 hot dog buns person didn't show up to deliver when they were supposed to. Tom didn't just say, oh boy, where am I going to get? I, no, we can't do this. Just not possible. Tom said, where, where, where do you want me to go? I said, Walmart. <laughs> he went to Walmart. And guess what? We had the hot dog buns. Philip's like, there's no way. We're too small, Jesus. We don't have the resources we need, Jesus. Philip, do you know who you're talking to? You're talking to God. We don't have enough money is not in his vocabulary. <laughs> I mean, it's funny when you think about it, right? Like, what doesn't God have? God has whatever he wants to have. And so, the side story happens with Andrew. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? There's this boy, he's got a little sack lunch. I don't know if you can do anything with it, but just thought I would mention it to you. Because I'm thinking Andrew has so much faith to where he's like, well, here's a start. <laughs> five loaves of bread. Not like loaves of bread, I'm sure. Like More like little personal <laughs> loaves of bread, you know, communion wafers, <laughs> maybe a little bigger. What do, but, but, I mean, here's what we have. What good is that for a huge crowd? And then Jesus says, tell everyone to sit down. Jesus said, so they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. And if there's 5,000 guys coming to church, you know there's probably 15,000. You know what I'm saying? Guys don't come to church alone. Just throwing that out there. That was a bad joke. But you know what I'm saying? Where there's men, there's women and children, right? So there's a lot more than 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with fish, the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. 
After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled twelve baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Pretty amazing story of one man that believes God enough to say, Hey, here's a little. God, what do you want to do with it? But the problem is, so many times we have a little, and we assume, God, you can't do anything with this. God will take the little and make it much. God will take the small and multiply it, increase it. Why do I never freak out about uh, money or salary or anything like that? Because I know that God has a way. He just has a way. Ever since I was an adult, I've been tithing. Why? Because I know that if I give, God's word says it will be given. And God is a lot better than any bank. His interest and his return is a lot greater than anything I'm going to find on the market today. And I'm a blessed man. Why? Because I believe, because I have remained faithful to God and he's allowed his favor and his blessing to be on my life. One of the reasons why Crossroads believes in being generous is because we recognize it's a godly characteristic and because God calls us to be generous. And whenever we're generous, God is much more generous, isn't he? You can't outgive God. You ever heard that said? Yes. You can't outgive Him. And that's what we see in this story Jesus doing a miracle. What would have happened if Andrew hadn't spoken up? See, so many times we see the problem, we don't see the solution is right in front of us. Andrew says, There's this boy, he doesn't have a lot, but he's got a little. Wonder, do we have a little today that God wants to use? So Andrew became a hero simply because he introduced people to Jesus that mattered to him. It wasn't just something he did because he had to either. It's something he loved to do. You understand, you have like the greatest news ever known to mankind, right? Amen. The wages of sin is death. It means we should spend eternity in hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says that God is faithful and just. If we confess our sins, He forgives us of our sins. So our sins cause us to go to hell, but Jesus steps in, lives a perfect life, pays the price for us. You know, last night we went to a nice dinner. My wife and I we were doing this. I had this thing where I said we were, we're going to go on, I think it's 52 dates in a year. Because I've. I, how many of you ever convicted, right? You're like, you know, I don't do what I'm supposed to do. You're supposed to keep, keep dating your spouse. And I, I just got enough of it. So I made it very public. I even told all you guys this was one of my goals is to have a date night every week with my wife. So last night we're sitting there and my wife, she's so kind. She decided to go to a restaurant just because she know I she knew I liked it you know and they had a special going on steak and lobster for $15.99 Woo! everybody's going to Outback for lunch I guess and here's the thing like when you have a meal you have to pay for the meal but Jesus came along. He paid the bill for us. Yes. He took care of what we owed, which we couldn't pay. Right. The Bible says, not one is righteous. No, not one. It says, if you're without sin, then you're a liar. And guess what? Lion's a sin. That makes, you a, that makes you a sinner. But we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And the greatest news ever is that Jesus stepped in and saved us from hell he did and here's the cool thing Andrew knows this and everybody Andrew comes in contact with he's like you gotta come see this guy he's amazing he's awesome he's the one that the prophet Isaiah wrote about he's the one that we've been looking forward to coming and he's come 
And that fact hasn't changed for thousands of years. It's still true today. Do you love introducing people to Jesus? Because it matters. But the thing is, is I think we believe this lie that everybody has their, their own... Listen, everybody's allowed to believe however they want to believe, which is true. It's true. Everybody's allowed to believe however they want to believe. But the sad thing is, is when they don't believe Jesus is the Savior of the world, when they don't confess with their sins with their mouth, then they spend eternity in hell. I have people all the time trying to convince me hell's not real. It's a very real place. I read the Bible and it talks about a place called hell. And it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. How awesome is that? I want everybody to know Jesus. I haven't met one person that came into a relationship with Jesus and their life got worse for it. It's only better. It only gets better. And I'll tell you, the most powerful way that you can introduce people to Jesus is just to simply share your story with them. Just share your story. Say, this is how I was, and then I met Jesus and everything changed. I mean, has He done anything good for you? Has He blessed you? Is your life better because of Him? Listen, there's so many times that I realize my life is better because of this book, the Word of God. <laughs> how appropriate that we sing Word of God speak today, right? Jesus is the Word of God. This makes our life better. Has your life gotten better since making him the Lord and Savior, making him the leader of your life? And then another thing that Andrew was a hero because, because people's lives were changed because of his influence. John chapter 20, verse 20 to 36. This is going to teach you, a few of you, something that you didn't know before this. But just so you know, Andrew is not a Hebrew name. Andrew is a Greek name. How did the Jews feel about the Greeks back in the day? Well, Jesus didn't care how they felt about them. <laughs> Jews hated Greeks. Greeks were trying to take their land, trying to take the power. In fact, they had taken power. And uh, there, was, there was complete opposition. As far as the Jewish religion, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not invited. The Jews were like, no way. Good luck. See you later. We're God's select elect and predestined and you're going to have to figure it out on your own. But that wasn't God's plan. Just funny to me that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, would pick a friend with a Greek name. Verse 20, some Greeks, some who? Greeks. So some Gentiles, non-Jewish, who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration, they're in town to see what the Mardi Gras is all about. They're there just to see what's going on. They're there for the party. They're not religious Greeks. They're just Greeks. They're kind of curious. It said, paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Why would Philip tell Andrew about it? Because Andrew is a person of influence. Significance. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his, into His glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me, because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. Father, bring glory to your name. 
Then a voice spoke from heaven saying, I have already brought glory to my name and I will do so again. When the crowd, wait, what crowd? The crowd that Andrew brought with him heard the voice. Some thought it was thunder while others declared an angel had spoken to him. Then Jesus told them the voice was for your benefit, not mine. The time for judging this world has come when Satan, the ruler of this world, will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. See, God draws everyone to himself. One of the reasons why we don't operate like Andrew, one of the reasons why we don't tell people about Jesus is because we think it's all about us. And it has very little to do with you. In fact, they won't come into a relationship because of you. They will only come into a relationship because draw, God draws all people unto himself. You are simply the avenue God has chosen to present the opportunity for them. So be careful in how you present that opportunity. Verse 33, he said this to indicate how he was going to die. The crowd responded, we understood from Scripture that the Messiah would live forever. How can you say the Son of Man will die? Just who is this Son of Man anyway? Jesus replied, my light will shine for you just a little longer. Walk in the light while you can so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in darkness cannot see where they are going. Put your trust in the light while there is still time. Then you will become children of the light. If you read on, it talks a little bit more about this. And then in verse 45, it literally says, Jesus is talking and it says, For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. Do you see the connection there? I can't say, listen, when you see me, you're seeing, you know, my dad. It doesn't work that way. He's saying, when you see me, you're seeing God. Jesus is telling everybody that he is God in the flesh right there. So maybe you've gone your whole life and you thought, well, Jesus was probably a good teacher. He was a good man. That's not enough. Jesus is God in flesh. John 12, 20 to 36, it shows that Jesus extended the salvation message to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, through Andrew. So many people teach that it was when Peter was hanging out on the rooftop and the, the sheet came down and, and that that's when, no, it's been God's plan from the beginning to save the Gentiles. From the beginning. And Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. He didn't use the excuse that he was uneducated. He realized he had the cure, the same cure that you and I do today. And then we recognize that he gave up an ordinary, comfortable life to follow Jesus. For some reason, we have in our culture today this idea that when we can finally get to that age, when we can retire, when we can be comfortable, when we can you know, do whatever we want, then we've arrived. And Jesus says, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. You see, anyone who wants to gain their life has to lose their life. But anyone who loves their life, ultimately they'll lose it. He's saying, what are you seeking? So many people think, you know, I'm too old. I'm done. No, you're not. You're still breathing, then God's using you. He's using you to do something. He's using you to be you. It's not just about career aspirations. It's about following Jesus. Andrew's an example of this. He, he, just, he just straight up threw away all career aspirations that he had. He said, you know what? I'm going to follow the Lord and His plan. He's a great example for us. And I believe with all of my heart that Andrew understood the importance of everyone hearing about Jesus and having an opportunity to serve Him as Lord and Savior. I believe we're giving you an easy way to invite people to church next week with this Friends Day. 
Are you going to be a friend like Andrew? Listen, I'm giving you full on rights and privileges to sit, just, just say we're having free food. Just come for the food. Come sit and hear a guy talk for a couple minutes and then you get free food. It's awesome. In fact, they, they like food at our church because we do. So how should we strive to be like Andrew? He's our model. How should we strive to be like him? Well, we should strive to be like him because people's eternities are at risk. Jude 1, 17 to 23. Listen to this. It says, But you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers who purpose, purpose in their life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. You think we're there yet? If you don't, just turn on the news. These people are the ones who are creating division among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's Spirit in them. You know, I'm going to talk for a second about um, something that's not in the notes, homosexuality. The fact is, the Bible says it's wrong, okay? And it doesn't mean we don't love that person because it also says that sex outside of marriage is wrong. Hello. If we're going to talk about one, let's talk about the other. It says overeating is wrong. Should I keep going on? I, I'm... <clears throat> But these things are our natural desires. They're what we want to do, but they're not what we should do. Amen. You want to do what's wrong because you're alive. But you don't do what's wrong because you serve Christ. And by the way, the things that you want to do that are wrong, where do they ultimately lead anyways? Disappointment, discouragement, despair, should I continue on? I mean, it, dead end ro road. That's where they lead. It says, these people are the ones among you creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in the most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that for a second. Our church is Pentecostal. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe the first step in your relationship with Christ is to receive salvation. That's You're good with salvation. You're going to heaven, all right? You, you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Conf confess your sins. He's faithful and just. He forgives you. And then we practice water baptism, which is really kind of the next step, which full immersion into water, just like Jesus did. And then we, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe when you confess your sins that God comes and lives in you, but there's an another thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit that happens and what we believe is the initial physical evidence of that is speaking in tongues in another language that you don't understand and I know to some of you it sounds trippy it's not trust me being raised Baptist I thought it was of the devil until I realized it was of God and that when I experienced it, it empowered me to do so much more than I ever could all right? It, it's, it's, uh, it builds you up. Why should you pray in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because it builds you up. We're to build each other up, and we're to be built up by the Lord Jesus himself. And await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love, and you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Show mercy to them. Yeah. Show mercy to them. Why? Because we are all sinners saved by grace. Yeah. I'm going to tell you this right now. There ain't nobody in this place holier than somebody else. We're all made perfect how? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us. See, he was perfect and he gave up his life. So now we are made perfect. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't always feel perfect. <laughs> right? We're still battling that natural desire, aren't we? That's what we're talking about, battling the natural desire, showing grace to them. And then this verse is, is critical. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. See, here's the deal. We don't hate sinners. We love sinners. We hate sin. I hate sin. Some of the times that I've talked with people to see what sin's done, shoot, in my own life, some of the things that sin has done. Devastating. When you play with sin, you get burned. Just don't do it. Do the best you can to honor God. 
And then we're going to show mercy and love because God is merciful and full of love. And then why should we strive to be like Andrew? Because uh, telling people about Jesus isn't optional. Telling people about Jesus isn't optional. Matthew 28, 19. I made it a little bit large so you could see it just in case you needed it. <laughs> Therefore, everybody say it with me. Go. One more time. Go. go. Not sit in your chairs, not stay and watch TV, but go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're to go, go, go. And you guys said, yep, and you got up and you left. No, not yet, almost. <laughs> we're going to go and we're going to be light. We're going to be light. We're going to do what Jesus told us to do. And we should strive to be like Andrew. We should have the right priorities. We should have the right priorities. You know, I, I talked to you earlier about the limited amount of time that we actually have church. You come to church so that you can leave and be the church. Okay? You're the church 100% of the time, by the way. You realize that? So you're in church. Technically, you, you could tell anybody you're in church all the time. <laughs> right? Hey, I am the church. <laughs> Matthew 6, 33 says this. It says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Seek God and live righteously. I just want to talk for a second. Again, not in the notes. I just believe this is for some people here. This is for me. I know that. Sometimes we get this part right, seek God, but we get this part wrong. There is a connection. There's a connection between seeking God and living righteously. God does not bless things that are unrighteous. He just doesn't. He loves people who are unrighteous, but He doesn't bless unrighteousness. He will never bless unrighteousness. God will never bless sin. Never. It's not in His character. And so we need to live righteously. That's why shine, right? Shine. Stay positive. Be humble. Live innocently. Be righteous. When you know what's right, do what's right. Even when it's hard. When somebody asks you to, to tell them the truth about something, tell them the truth in love. When they give you back too much change at the store, it isn't, oh, sorry, sucker. It's an opportunity to show Christ. So what are we seeking? That's the first question I have to ask you today is, personally, what are we seeking? Is it happiness? Is it financial stability? You know, what is it? We're all seeking things. But can you truly say that you're seeking God? And this is a personal question, by the way. This isn't something anybody but you can answer for yourself. Is God really a priority in my life? Is His Word really a priority in my life? I mean, how are you ever going to learn to live according to the Word of God if you don't read the Word of God? Is it a priority? And then another question to ask yourself, what are some reasons that we don't invite friends to church? I'll tell you this, that when I was younger, I was afraid of rejection. And then I learned something. I learned that it wasn't me that they were rejecting. It wasn't. Okay? Okay? We are blessed to be in relationship with God. We're just simply op offering the opportunity for others to have that relationship. Jesus will draw all men unto himself. So why are we not inviting people into relationship with God, into, into church? And then the third question is just, who have you invited who have you invited? I encourage you this week, make the big ask. What do you risk? What are you really risking? I'll tell you what you're risking. If you're too afraid of what they're going to think, then you're risking their eternity. 
You see that? Oh, they're going to think I'm a nut job. They're going to think I'm weird. I'd rather have somebody think I'm weird than for one day me to get to heaven and for Jesus to ask me, yo, dude, I gave you this opportunity. Why didn't you take it? Here's what I believe. I believe that when we get to heaven, the Bible says we're going to give an account for everything. I believe when he says he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, I believe he's going to show us opportunities where we could have spoke truth to people. We could have introduced them to Jesus and we missed it. And those people may not be in heaven. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Because what do we have to be sad for in heaven? The only thing would be lost souls. I guarantee you this. When you get to heaven, there's going to be nothing worth crying for except for your loved ones not being there. Amen? Let's be light. Let's be the church. Let's take every opportunity to tell people about Jesus that we can. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Him, it's awesome. You can start it at any point in this journey called life. You just tell Him, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. Forgive me, Jesus. Let's pray.